Around 1961, about the time I was turning 12, I'd say, I was offered a course at the Presbyterian Church in Ithaca, New York. And all I knew, having to do with this course, which would have maybe 12 kids in it, was that at the end of this series of classes, we'd each get our own Bible with our own name, each of us, embossed in gold lettering on the front of the Bible. And I guess I was my mother's son because I wasn't one to let a bargain like that go by. My own name embossed in gold on the front of this Bible. That really appealed to me. So I signed up for the class. I don't think I'd been a particularly good attendee of Sunday school classes. I know I wasn't. I hadn't been a good attendee of that lugubrious First Presbyterian Church, for that matter. No one in my family had been especially faithful to that Presbyterian Church. My sister Anne, who was six years older, was a member of its choir, because she was still in high school at that point. The Presbyterian Church had a very good choir master, Vito E. Mason. He was also the choir master at the high school, so Anne was probably in both choirs. Ted had been and possibly still was in the choir downtown because he enjoyed it himself. But that was probably the most attendance that could be relied on from the Mosier family. My mother especially was tempted away by any other Protestant church in town that was supposed to have a good minister who could come up with good sermons. I remember for a while we attended the Congregational Church up on Highland Road, I think it was, right across the road from my brother's fraternity at Cornell, Acacia Fraternity. We went there for a while. They had a young minister who gave good liberal sermons Mom approved of. Anne and I tagged along dutifully. But my attendance at church, as I recollect, lapsed along about when I was eight nine years old, I lost interest in the whole idea of God. Not so much Jesus, but God. Jesus was appealing, but I was starting to notice the discrepancy between what these adults claimed about God and what Jesus himself had preached. It didn't take anyone with a very elevated intellect to start to see that discrepancy by nine or ten years old but still a Bible with my own name on it in gold. It's hard to say no. So I signed up. There was another period along in there when I went to the Methodist church, not because mom wanted to go there, but because she had ditched me to go off traveling with my father for three months in the fall of my fourth grade year, whichever year that would have been. 1958, 59, somewhere in there. And this other family that had been living with us, they also had been missionaries, and they had lived a number of years in Tennessee, and they had sent their two sons to military academy, I think. At least one of them was causing a little trouble. They sent him off military academy. The father, in particular, was a fairly rigid person. I did not look forward to spending months and months with that family, but that was mom's decision, and I was stuck with it. And I went with them to the Methodist Church. Its message, far as I could tell, wasn't any better or any worse than the First Presbyterian message or the Congregationalist message. They're all about the same, and they all had this hypocrisy central to them. They all depended on you believing in this God idea, like you believe in a fairy tale, it seemed to me. A fairy tale that 
went deep and wide throughout our culture, but a fairy tale. Now, the Methodist church was every bit as gloomy a stone structure as the Presbyterian church. Great big granite blocks building up both of these places. Lots of dustiness. Not pleasant places for a little boy. I didn't care for them. I had an aesthetic sense. Even then, I didn't like these buildings on the outside or the inside. You had to sit through these sermons, sit through Sunday school classes, nod your head when it was expected. One other slightly appealing thing about this series of classes when I was 12, about the time a Catholic kid enters the church and gets all these presents. Protestants, we didn't get presents when we joined. There was no tradition of that that I was aware of. Nothing promised in that department except this Bible with my name in gold. Catholic kids, they scored all kinds of things. When they turned 12 or 13, the girls wore these fancy white dresses. The boys wore equivalent Sunday outfits. I did know that Catholics got to go into a kind of a booth the size of a phone booth, and they could admit their sins to whoever was sitting on the other side of the screen. It's supposed to be a priest, but it could have been anyone, as far as I knew. Whisper through the grill to this man on the other side who was prompting them with questions and would come back with some sort of penalty they would have to do, penance. Recite the rosary or this and that. That was described to me as a kid, even though we weren't Catholic. My mother did not have a high opinion of Catholicism. I don't know that she had such a high opinion of Presbyterianism, for that matter. We did get a magazine called Presbyterian Life, and when Jehovah's Witnesses would come around to our house, they came around often because their training colony was somewhere up the lake from us. They'd try selling their Watchtower magazine to Mom and their pamphlet called Awake. She would encourage them to blather on for a while. She'd listen to a little of their spiel, and then she'd say, I'll tell you what, I'll trade you a copy of your Watchtower magazine for a copy I have right here of Presbyterian Life. And she would hold that magazine up in this mock offer to this poor young kid in a white shirt and tie in the hot sun in the afternoon. And they'd go around in pairs, and they'd have to approach, knock on doors. They must have hated that, hated it. But Mom made it worse by her smart retort. I never had to attend their church. Would it have seemed different? I have no idea. Catholic church, I know, would have been different because the Minister there dressed up like a woman in these long gowns, and they swung these things around and made a funny smell in the church. I'd heard about that, probably sarcastically, from my mother. And my brother had played the Tom Lehrer record that had the Vatican rag on it, very fast, upbeat piano tempo. First you get down on your knees, fiddle with your rosaries. Genuflect, genuflect, genuflect. He came to that part, my mother would laugh till she was crying. Because in her hometown of Buffalo, Illinois, where she'd been a farm girl, Buffalo with all of three or four hundred residents, one of her cousins or somebody she knew had been done wrong by a priest at some point. And she hadn't forgiven the Pope and the entire church after that incident. Anyway, we'd gone to several churches, and now I was taking this series of classes at the Presbyterian Church. There were 10 or 12 of us in the class, both boys and girls. We got into discussions. At this point, we had a young minister at the Presbyterian Church. I don't remember his name. His predecessor, I think, was Walter A. Dobbs, who was a very sweet man, but an old man. And he sounded like an old man, and he probably smelled a little bit like an old man when we were shaking his hand, leaving the church. My parents had known him before. He might have visited them in Allahabad in India, for all I know. He might have had an Indian missionary link somehow. But his sermons seemed to me as a kid to be a little bit dreary. 
interminable. Long about the time I was eight was the time I had firmly been disabused of the idea of Santa Claus, in whom I had believed. And that was a great letdown to learn that Santa Claus was a fraud perpetrated on me by all these adults. And I think I extended it to the idea of uh, God in the big church with the big long sermons. It never took. I didn't buy it. I'd never seen any miracle occur, never seen anyone healed by a laying on of the hands by any prophet, Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha or anybody else. Didn't buy it as a kid. Don't buy it as an adult. Never did buy it, really. But I took the class anyway because I wanted the Bible. Talk about hypocrisy. There was a perfect example right there, and I knew I was being a hypocrite. I might have felt a little embarrassed inside myself, but I was determined to get that Bible. So it came to the last session, the last class session. This young, friendly minister went around our round table and asked us each in our turn if we wanted to join the church. And they all said yes in turn. And he got to me last, as it happened. I was sitting to his right. He got to me last, and I said no. He said, oh, that's interesting. Would you mind staying after our session today a little bit? We could talk this over. I said, no, I wouldn't mind. So I sat and talked with him for a while, made clear to him that I didn't believe in any of it, really. There was a pause. I said, do I still get the Bible? And he said, sure, you get the Bible. So they're all ready. They're all prepared. They've been embossed with your names. We're not going to throw yours out or anything. You get your Bible. Maybe you'll like reading it at some point. Here it is. Richard Wynne Mosier, spelled out in gold. Holy Bible, Revised Standard Edition. Now, it wasn't until years and years later that I was in college and took a class on religion, maybe specifically on Christianity, and was interested in reading it. Not the whole thing. I had tried reading it straight through from Genesis at one point. That hadn't worked out so well. Got bogged down somewhere in the begats. It was pretty dull going. But the part assigned to us in my college course, those parts were were more interesting. They were mostly the Gospels, as I recall. And I read them with interest. I looked at my Bible, and it had none of this beautiful poetry in it that the Bible we were reading from in our college class had, the King James Version of the Bible. So I was very disappointed in this Bible that I'd been awarded earlier, my name on it, to find that all the, all the poetry was gone. Like in the Psalms especially, the uh, 23rd Psalm, which I've heard so many times at uh, funerals, it has had all the poetry leached out of it in this version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Already it's suffering here. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Man, where's the poetry in this? So much for this Bible with my name on it. So I went out and bought a Bible. And you can just hear the wonderful difference in this version of King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. 
In the other one, it says, my cup runs over, or my cup overflows, or something. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, how nice is that, as language goes, and as fairy tales go. Forever I'll live in the house of the Lord. What an idea. Isn't that sweet? But I didn't buy it then. I don't buy it now. Such terrible things wouldn't go on in this earth if there was a merciful God. That's what I thought back then. Mankind wouldn't have been in existence for so many thousands of years without doing away with war. If there were a God, a just God. If we're going to treat each other well, we have to do it on our own. Fairy tales won't help us. That's what I thought as a nine-year-old. That's what I think still. But I do have my gold-embossed Bible. I've also got two other Bibles. When I was a student in France in 1964-65, we were given Bibles at the denomination free school where I was. It was a, nominally a Protestant school. There were Catholic students there as well. And I've always kept the Bible I got there. I've always liked the idea of it. But my favorite Bible is this one I found in my Uncle Gene Hall's personal effects. When my cousin Dave and my brother Ted and I went out to Iliopolis, Illinois, to go through his things. This little Bible, it's just a New Testament and the Psalms, was given to him, it says here, by his parents, and I believe they gave it to him in the outbreak of World War II, in which he did not serve in the armed services, but did serve in the Merchant Marine, which was every bit as risky. He saw Merchant ships exploded to the right and left of his at various times throughout the war. And he kept this little New Testament with him. This is a King James version of the Bible. And my favorite, this little one that my Uncle Gene had through the war. If I ever had to swear on a Bible, this is the one I'd choose. Thank mm -hmm. you.